outside ten. In May of that same year, the naked body of a fifteen-year-old girl was found in a rose field, halfway between Grasse and the hamlet of Opio, east of town. She had been killed by a heavy blow to the back of the head. The farmer who discovered her was so disconcerted by the gruesome sight that he almost ended up a suspect himself, when in a quivering voice he told the police lieutenant that he had never seen anything so beautiful, when he had really wanted to say that he had never seen anything so awful. She was indeed a girl of exquisite beauty. She was one of those languid women made of dark honey, smooth and sweet and terribly sticky, who take control of a room with a syrupy gesture, a toss of the hair, a single slow whiplash of the eyes, and all the while remain as still as the centre of a hurricane, apparently unaware of the force of gravity by which they irresistibly attract to themselves the yearnings and the souls of both men and women. And she was young, so very young, that the flow of her allure had not yet grown viscous. Her full limbs were still smooth and solid, her breasts plump and pert as hard-boiled eggs, and the planes of her face, brushed by her heavy black hair, still had the most delicate contours and secret places. Her hair, however, was gone. The murderer had cut it off and taken it with him, along with her clothes. People suspected the gypsies. Gypsies were capable of anything. Gypsies were known to weave carpets out of old clothes and to stuff their pillows with human hair and to make dolls out of the skin and teeth of the hanged. Only gypsies could be involved in such a perverse crime. There were, however, no gypsies around at the time, not a one near or far. Gypsies had last come through the area in December. For lack of gypsies, people decided to suspect the Italian migrant workers. But there weren't any Italians around either. It was too early in the year for them. They would first arrive in the region in June, at the time of the jasmine harvest. So it could not have been the Italians either. Finally, the wig makers came under suspicion, and they were searched for the hair of the murdered girl, to no avail. Then it was the Jews who were suspect. Then the monks of the Benedictine cloister, reputedly a lecherous lot, although all of them were well over seventy. Then the Cistercians, then the Freemasons, then the lunatics from the Charité, then the charcoal burners, then the beggars, and last but not least, the nobility, in particular the Marquis de Cabri, for he had already been married three times and organised, so it was said, orgiastic black masses in his cellars where he drank the blood of virgins to increase his potency. Of course, nothing definite could be proved. No one had witnessed the murder, the clothes and hair of the dead woman were not found, after several weeks, the police lieutenant halted his investigation. In mid-June, the Italians arrived, many with families, to hire themselves out as pickers. The farmers put them to work as usual, but with the murder still on their minds, forbade their wives and daughters to have anything to do with them. You couldn't be too cautious. For although the migrant workers were in fact not responsible for the actual murder, they could have been responsible for it on principle, and so it was better to be on one's guard. Not long after the beginning of the jasmine harvest, two more murders occurred. Again, the victims were very lovely young girls, again of the languid, raven-haired sort. Again, they were found naked and shorn and lying in a flower field with the backs of their heads bludgeoned. Again, there was no trace of the perpetrator. The news spread like wildfire, and there was a threat that hostile action might be taken against the migrants when it was learned that both victims were Italians, the daughters of a Genoese day labourer. And now fear spread over the countryside. People no longer knew against whom to direct their impotent rage. Although there were still those who suspected the lunatics or the cryptic Marquis, no one really believed it, for the former were under guard day and night, and the latter had long since departed for Paris. So people huddled closer together. The farmers opened up their barns for the migrants, who until then had slept in the open fields. The townsfolk set up nightly patrols in every neighbourhood. The police lieutenant reinforced the watch at the gates. But all these measures proved useless. A few days after the double murder, they found the body of yet another girl, abused in the same manner as the others. This time it was a Sardinian washerwoman from the bishop's palace. She had been struck down near the great basin of the Fontaine de la Fou, directly before the gates of the city. And although at the insistence of the citizenry, the consuls initiated still further measures, the tightest possible control at the gates, a reinforced night wash, a curfew for all female persons after nightfall. 
All that summer, not a single week went by when the body of a young girl was not discovered. And they were always girls just approaching womanhood, and always very beautiful and usually dark, sugary types. Soon, however, the murderer was no longer rejecting the type of girl more common among the local population, soft, pale-skinned, and somewhat more full-bodied. Even brown-haired girls and some dark blondes, as long as they weren't too skinny, were among the later victims. He tracked them down everywhere, not just in the open country around Grass, but in the town itself, right in their homes. The daughter of a carpenter was found slain in her own room on the fifth floor, and no one in the house had heard the least noise, and although the dogs normally yelped the moment they picked up the scent of any stranger, not one of them had barked. The murderer seemed impalpable, incorporeal, like a ghost. People were outraged and reviled the authorities. The least rumour caused mob scenes. A travelling salesman of love potions and other nostrums was almost massacred, for word spread that one of the ingredients in his remedies was female hair. Fires were set at both Cabri's mansion and the Hôpital de la Charité. A servant returning home one night was shot down by his own master, the woolen draper Alexandre Minard, who mistook him for the infamous murderer of young girls. Whoever could afford it sent his adolescent daughters to distant relatives or to boarding schools in Nice, Aix or Marseille. The police lieutenant was removed from office at the insistence of the town council. His successor had the College of Medicine examine the bodies of the shorn beauties to determine the state of their virginity. It was found that they had all remained untouched. Strangely enough, this knowledge only increased the sense of horror, for everyone had secretly assumed that the girls had been ravished. People had at least known the murderer's motive. Now they knew nothing at all. They were totally perplexed. And whoever believed in God sought succour in the prayer that at least his own house should be spared this visitation from hell. The town council was a committee of thirty of the richest and most influential commoners and nobles in Grasse. The majority of them were enlightened and anti-clerical, paid not the least attention to the bishop, and would have preferred to turn the cloisters and abbeys into warehouses or factories. In their distress, the proud, powerful men of the town council condescended to write an abject petition begging the bishop to curse and excommunicate this monster who murdered young girls and yet whom temporal powers could not capture, just as his illustrious predecessor had done in the year 1708 when terrible locusts had threatened the land. And indeed, at the end of September, the slayer of the young women of Grasse having cut down no fewer than twenty-four of its most beautiful virgins out of every social class, was made anathema and excommunicated both in writing and from all the pulpits of the city, including a ban spoken by the bishop himself from the pulpit of Notre Dame de Puy. The result was conclusive. From one day to the next, the murders ceased. October and November passed with no corpses. At the start of December, reports came in from Grenoble that a murderer there was strangling young girls, then tearing their clothes to shreds and pulling their hair out by the handfuls. And although these coarse methods in no way squared with the cleanly executed crimes of the grass murderer, everyone was convinced that it was one and the same person. In their relief that the beast was no longer among them, but instead ravaging Grenoble, a good seven days' journey distant, the citizens of Grasse crossed themselves three times over. They organized a torchlight procession in honor of the bishop, and celebrated a mass of thanksgiving on the 24th of December. On the 1st of January, 1766, the tighter security measures were relaxed and the nighttime curfew for women was lifted. Normality returned to public and private life with incredible speed. Fear had melted into thin air. No one spoke of the terror that had ruled both town and countryside only a few months before. Not even the families involved still spoke of it. It was as if the bishop's curse had not only banned the murderer, but every memory of him, and the people were pleased that it was so. But any man who still had a daughter just approaching that special age did not, even now, allow her to be without supervision. Twilight brought misgivings, and each morning, when he found her healthy and cheerful, he rejoiced, though, of course, without actually admitting the reason why. There was one man in Grasse, however, who did not trust this peace, his name was Antoine Richy. He held the title of second consul, and he lived in a grand residence at the entrance to the Rue Droite. Richy was a widower and had a daughter named Laure. 
Although not yet forty years old and of undiminished vigour, he intended to put off a second marriage for some time yet. First he wanted to find a husband for his daughter, and not the first comer either, but a man of rank. There was a baron de Bouillon who had a son and an estate near Vence, a man of good reputation and miserable financial situation, with whom Richie had already concluded a contract concerning the future marriage of their children. Once he had married Laure off, he planned to put out his own courting feelers in the direction of the highly esteemed houses of Drey, Maubert, or Fontmichel. Not because he was vain and would be damned if he didn't get a noble bedmate, but because he wanted to found a dynasty and to put his own posterity on a track leading directly to the highest social and political influence. For that he needed at least two sons, one to take over his business, the other to pursue a law career leading to the parliament in Aix and advancement to the nobility. Given his present rank, however, he could hold out hopes for such success only if he managed intimately to unite his own person and family with provincial nobility. Only one thing justified such high-soaring plans, his fabulous wealth. Antoine Richie was far and away the wealthiest citizen anywhere around. He possessed latifundia not only in the area of Grasse, where he planted oranges, oil, wheat and hemp, but also near Vence and over towards Antibes, where he leased out his farms. He owned houses in Aix and houses in the country, owned shares in ships that traded with India, had a permanent office in Genoa, and was the largest wholesaler for scents, spices, oils and leathers in France. The most precious thing that Richie possessed, however, was his daughter. She was his only child, just turned sixteen, with auburn hair and green eyes. She had a face so charming that visitors of all ages and both sexes would stand stock still at the sight of her, unable to pull their eyes away, practically licking that face with their eyes, the way tongues work at ice cream, with that typically stupid, single-minded expression on their faces that goes with concentrated licking. Even Richie would catch himself looking at his daughter for indefinite periods of time, a quarter of an hour, a half hour perhaps, forgetting the rest of the world, even his business, which otherwise did not happen even in his sleep, melting away in contemplation of this magnificent girl, and afterwards unable to say what it was he had been doing. And of late, he noticed this with uneasiness, of an evening when he brought her to her bed, or sometimes of a morning when he went in to waken her, and she still lay sleeping as if put to rest by God's own hand, and the forms of her hips and breasts were moulded in the veil of her nightgown, and her breath rose calm and hot from the frame of bosom, contoured shoulder, elbow and smooth forearm, in which she had laid her face. Then he would feel an awful cramping in his stomach, and his throat would seem too tight, and he would swallow and, God help him, would curse himself for being this woman's father, and not some stranger, not some other man, before whom she lay as she lay now before him, and who then, without scruple and full of desire, could lie down next to her, on her, in her. And he broke out in a sweat, and his arms and legs trembled while he choked down this dreadful lust, and bent down to wake her with a chaste, fatherly kiss. During the year past, at the time of the murders, these fatal temptations had not yet come over him. The magic that his daughter worked on him then, or so at least it seemed to him, had still been a childish magic, and thus he had not been seriously afraid that Law would be one of the murderer's victims, since everyone knew that he attacked neither children nor grown women, but exclusively ripening but virginal girls. He had indeed augmented the watch of his home, had had new grills placed at the windows of the top floor, and had directed Law's maid to share her bedchamber with her. But he was loath to send her away as his peers had done with their daughters, some even with their entire families. He found such behaviour despicable and unworthy of a member of the town council and second consul, who, he suggested, should be a model of composure, courage and resolution to his fellow citizens. Besides which, he was a man who did not let his decisions be made for him by other people not by a crowd thrown into panic, and certainly not by some anonymous piece of criminal trash. And so, all during those terrible days, he had been one of the few people in the town who were immune to the fever of fear, and kept a cool head. But, strange to say, this had now changed. While others publicly celebrated the end of the rampage as if the murderer were already hanged and had soon fully forgotten about those dreadful days, 
Fear crept into Antoine Richie's heart like a foul poison. For a long time he would not admit that it was fear that caused him to delay trips that ought to have been made some time ago, or to be reluctant merely to leave the house, or to break off visits and meetings just so that he could quickly return home. He gave himself the excuse that he was out of sorts or overworked, but admitted as well that he was a bit concerned, as every father with a daughter of marriageable age is concerned, a thoroughly normal concern. Had not the fame of her beauty already gone out to the wider world? Did not people stretch their necks even now when he accompanied her to church on Sundays? Were not certain gentlemen on the council already making advances in their own names or in those of their sons? But then, one day in March, Rishi was sitting in the salon and watched as Laure walked out into the garden. She was wearing a blue dress, her red hair falling down over it and blazing in the sunlight. He had never seen her look so beautiful. She disappeared behind a hedge, and it took about two heartbeats longer than he had expected before she emerged again. And he was frightened to death, for during those two heartbeats he thought he had lost her forever. That same night he awoke out of a terrifying dream, the details of which he could no longer remember, but it had had to do with Laure, and he burst into her room, convinced that she was dead, lay there in her bed, murdered, violated and shorn, and found her unharmed. He went back to his chamber, bathed in sweat and trembling with agitation. No, not with agitation, but with fear, for he finally admitted it to himself. It was naked fear that had seized him, and in admitting it he grew calmer and his thoughts clearer. To be honest, he had not believed in the efficacy of the bishop's anathema from the start, nor that the murderer was now prowling about Grenoble, nor that he had ever left town. No, he was still living here, among the citizens of Grasse, and at some point he would strike again. Rishi had seen several of the girls murdered during the August and September. The sight had horrified him, and at the same time, he had to admit, fascinated him, for they all, each in her own special way, had been dazzling beauties. He never would have thought that there was so much unrecognized beauty in grass. The murderer had opened his eyes. The murderer possessed exquisite taste. And he had a system. It was not just that all the murders had been carried out in the same efficient manner, but the very choice of victims betrayed intentions almost economical in their planning. To be sure, Rishi did not know what the murderer actually craved from his victims, since he could not have robbed them of the best that they offered, their beauty and the charm of youth. Or could he? In any case, it seemed to him, as absurd as it sounded, that the murderer was not a destructive personality, but rather a careful collector. For if one imagined, and so Rishi imagined, all the victims, not as single individuals, but as parts of some higher principle, and thought of each one's characteristics as merged in some idealistic fashion into a unifying whole, then the picture assembled out of such mosaic pieces would be the picture of absolute beauty, and the magic that radiated from it would no longer be of human, but of divine origin. As we can see, Rishi was an enlightened thinker who did not shrink from blasphemous conclusions, and though he was not thinking in olfactory categories, but rather in visual ones, he was nevertheless very near the truth. Assuming then, Rishi continued in his thoughts, that the murderer was just such a collector of beauty and was working on the picture of perfection, even if only in the fantasy of his sick brain, assuming, however, that he was the man of sublime taste and perfect methods that he indeed appeared to be, then one could not assume that he would waive claim to the most precious component on earth needed for his picture, the beauty of law. His entire previous homicidal work would be worth nothing without her. She was the keystone to his building. As he drew this horrifying conclusion, Rishi was sitting in his nightshirt on the edge of his bed, and he was amazed at how calm he had become. He no longer felt chilled, was no longer trembling. The vague fear that had plagued him for weeks had vanished and was replaced by the awareness of a specific danger. Law had quite obviously been the goal of all the murderer's endeavours from the beginning, and all the other murders were adjuncts to the last crowning murder. It remained quite unclear what material purpose these murders were intended to serve, or if they even had one at all. 
but Rishi had perceived the essence of the matter, the murderer's systematic method and his idealistic motive. The longer he thought about it, the better both of these pleased him, and the greater his admiration for the murderer, an admiration, admittedly, that reflected back upon him, as would a polished mirror, for after all it was he, Rishi, who had picked up his opponent's trail with his own refined and analytical powers of reasoning. If he, Rishi, had been the murderer and were himself possessed by the murderer's passions and ideas, he would not have been able to proceed in any other fashion than had been employed thus far, and like him he would do his utmost to crown his mad work with the murder of the unique and splendid Lore. This last thought appealed to him especially. Because he was in the position to put himself inside the mind of the would-be murderer of his daughter, he had made himself vastly superior to the murderer. For all his intelligence, that much was certain, the murderer was not in the position to put himself inside Rishi's mind, if only because he could not even begin to suspect that Rishi had long since imagined himself in the murderer's own situation. This was fundamentally no different from how things worked in business. Mutatis mutandis, to be sure. You were master of a competitor whose intentions you had seen through. There was no way he could get the better of you, not if your name was Antoine Richy and you were a natural fighter, a seasoned fighter. After all, the largest wholesale perfume business in France, his wealth, his office as second consul, these had not fallen into his lap as gracious gifts, but he had fought for them with doggedness and deceit, recognizing dangers ahead of time, shrewdly guessing his competitors' plans, and outdistancing his opponents. And in just the same way he would achieve his future goals, power and noble rank for his heirs. And in no other way would he counter the plans of the murderer, his competitor for the possession of law. If only because law was also the keystone in the edifice of his, of Rishi's own plans. He loved her, certainly, but he needed her as well. And he would let no one wrest from him whatever it was he needed to realize his own highest ambitions. He would hold on tooth and claw to that. He felt better now, having succeeded by these nocturnal deliberations in bringing his struggle with the demon down to the level of a business rivalry. He felt fresh courage, indeed arrogance, take hold of him. The last remnants of fear were gone. The despondency and anxious care that had tormented him into doddering senility had vanished. The fog of gloomy foreboding in which he had tapped about for weeks had lifted. He found himself on familiar terrain and felt himself equal to every challenge. Relieved, almost elated, he sprang from his bed, pulled the bell rope and ordered the drowsy valet who staggered into his room to pack clothes and provisions because at daybreak he intended to set out for Grenoble in the company of his daughter. Then he dressed and chased the rest of the servants from their beds. In the middle of the night, the house on the Rue Droite awoke and bustled with life. The fire blazed up in the kitchen, excited maids scurried along the corridors, servants dashed up and down the stairs, in the vaulted cellars the keys of the steward rattled, in the courtyard torches shone, grooms ran among the horses, others tugged mules from their stalls, there was bridling and saddling and running and loading. One would have almost believed that the Austro-Sardinian hordes were on the march, pillaging and torching, just as in 1746, and that the lord of the manor was mobilizing to flee in panic. Not at all. The lord of the manor was sitting at his office desk, a sovereign as a marshal of France, drinking café au lait and providing instructions for the constant stream of domestics barging in on him. All the while he wrote letters to the mayor, to the first consul, to his secretary, to his solicitor, to his banker in Marseille, to the baron de Bouillon, and to diverse business partners. By around six that morning he had completed his correspondence and given all the orders necessary to carry out his plans. He tucked away two small travelling pistols, buckled on his money belt and locked his desk. Then he went to awaken his daughter. By eight o'clock the little caravan was on the move. Rishi rode at its head. He was a splendid sight in his gold-braided burgundy coat beneath a black riding coat and black hat with jaunty feathers. He was followed by his daughter, dressed less showily, but so radiantly beautiful that the people along the street and at the windows had eyes only for her their fervent ahs and ohs passing through the crowd while the men doffed their hats, apparently for the second consul, but in reality for her, the regal woman. 
Then almost unnoticed came her maid, then Rishi's valet with two pack horses. The notoriously bad condition of the road to Grenoble meant that a wagon could not be used, and the end of the parade was drawn up by a dozen mules laden with all sorts of stuff and supervised by two grooms. At the Porte du Cour, the watch presented arms and only let them drop when the last mule had tramped by. Children ran behind them for a good little while, waving at the baggage crew as they slowly moved up the steep, winding road into the mountains. The departure of Antoine Richie and his daughter made a strange but deep impression on people. It was as if they had witnessed some archaic, sacrificial procession. The word spread that Rishi was going to Grenoble, to the very city where the monster who murdered young girls was now residing. People did not know what to think about that. Did what Rishi was doing show criminal negligence or admirable courage? Was he daring or placating the gods? They had only the vague foreboding that they had just seen this beautiful girl with the red hair for the last time. They suspected that Lord Rishi might be lost. This suspicion would prove correct, although the presumptions it was based upon were completely false. Rishi was not heading for Grenoble at all. The pompous departure was nothing but a diversionary tactic. A mile and a half northwest of Grasse, near the village of saint Valier, he ordered a halt. He handed his valet letters of attorney and transmittal and ordered him to bring the mule train and grooms to Grenoble by himself. He, however, turned off with Laure and her maid in the direction of Cabri, where they rested at midday, and then rode straight across the mountains of the Tanneron towards the south. The path was an extremely arduous one, but it allowed them to circumvent Grasse and its basin in a great arc and to arrive on the coast by evening without being recognized. The following day, according to Rishi's plan, he would ferry across with Laure to the Ile de Lérin, on the smaller of which was located the well-fortified monastery of Saint-Honorat. It was managed by a handful of elderly but quite able-bodied monks whom Rishi knew very well, since for years he had bought and resold the monastery's total production of eucalyptus cordial, pine nuts and cypress oil. And there, in the monastery of Saint-Honorat, which, except for the prison of Chateau d'If and the state prison on the Ile Sainte-Marguerite, was probably the safest place in Provence, he intended to lodge his daughter for the present. But he would immediately return to the mainland, this time circumventing Grasse on the east via Antibes and Cagne, and arrive in Vence by evening of the same day. He had ordered his secretary to proceed there in order to prepare the agreement with Baron de Bouillon concerning the marriage of their children Laure and Alphonse. He hoped to make Bouillon an offer that he could not refuse. Assumption of his debts, up to 40,000 livres, a dowry consisting of an equal sum, as well as diverse land holdings and an oil mill near Maganosk, a yearly income of 3,000 livres for the young couple. Rishi's only conditions were that the marriage should take place within ten days and be consummated on the wedding day, and that the couple should thereafter take up residence in Vence. Rishi knew that in acting so hastily he was driving the price excessively high for the union of his house with the house of Bouillon. He would have got it cheaper had he waited longer. The baron would have begged for permission to raise the social rank of the daughter of a bourgeois wholesaler through a marriage to his son, for the fame of Laure's beauty would only grow, just as would Rishi's wealth and Bouillon's financial miseries. But what did that matter? His opponent in this deal was not the baron, but the unknown murderer. He was the one whose business had to be spoiled. A married woman, deflowered and if possible already pregnant, would no longer fit into his exclusive gallery. The last mosaic stone would be tarnished. Law would have lost all value for the murderer. His enterprise would have failed. And he was to feel his defeat. Rishi wanted to hold the wedding ceremony in grass, with great pomp and open to the public. And even if he could not know his adversary, would never know him, he would take personal pleasure in knowing that he was in attendance at the event and would have to watch with his own eyes as that which he most desired was snatched away from under his nose. The plan was nicely thought out, and once again we must admire Rishi's acumen for coming so close to the truth. For in point of fact, the marriage of Laure Rishi to the son of the Baron de Bouillon would have meant a devastating defeat for the murderer of the Maidens of Grasse. But the plan was not yet carried out. Rishi had not yet rescued his daughter by marrying her off. He had not yet ferried her across to the safety of the monastery of Saint-Honorat. 
the three riders were still passing through the inhospitable mountains of the Tanneron. Sometimes the path was so bad that they had to dismount from their horses. It was all going too slowly. By evening, they hoped to reach the sea near La Napoule, a small town west of Cannes. At the same time that Laure Richy and her father were leaving Grasse, Grenouille was at the other end of town in the Arnulfi workshop, macerating jonquils. He was alone and he was in good spirits. His days in Grasse were coming to an end. His day of triumph was imminent. Out in his cabin was a crate padded with cotton. In it were twenty-four tiny flacons filled with drops of the congealed aura of twenty-four virgins precious essences that Grenouille had produced over the last year by cold oil enfleurage of their bodies, digestion of their hair and clothes, lavage and distillation. And the twenty-fifth, the most precious and important of all, he planned to fetch today. For his final fishing expedition, he had at the ready a small pot of oils purified several times over, a cloth of finest linen, and a demijohn of high-proof alcohol. The terrain had been studied down to the last detail. The moon was new. He knew that any attempt to break into the well-protected mansion on the Rue Duat was pointless, which was why he planned, just as dusk fell and before the doors were closed, to sneak in under his cover of odorlessness, which, like a magic cape, deprived man and beast of their perceptive faculties, and there to hide in some nook of the house. Then later, when everyone was asleep, he would follow the compass of his nose through the darkness and climb up to the chamber that held his treasure. He would set to work on it with his oil-drenched cloths right then and there. All that he would take with him would be, as usual, the hair and clothes, since these could be washed directly in rectified spirit, which could be done more conveniently in the workshop. He estimated it would take an additional night to complete the production of the pomade and to distill the concentrate. And if everything went well, and he had no reason to doubt that everything would go well, then by the day after tomorrow he would possess all of the essences needed for the best perfume in the world, and he would leave grass as the world's most fragrant human being. Around noon he was finished with his jonquils. He doused the fire, covered the pot of oil, and stepped outside of the workshop to cool off. The wind was from the west, with his very first breath, he knew something was wrong. The atmosphere was not as it should be. In the city's aromatic garb, that veil of many thousands of woven threads, the golden thread was missing. During the last few weeks, the fragrance of that thread had grown so strong that Grenouille had clearly discerned it from his cabin on the far side of the town. Now it was gone, vanished, untraceable, despite the most intensive sniffing. Grenouille was almost paralyzed with fright. She is dead, he thought. Then, more terrifying still, someone else has got to her before me. Someone else has plucked my flower and taken its odour for himself. He could not so much as scream, the shock was too great for that, but he could produce tears that welled up in the corners of his eyes and suddenly streamed down both sides of his nose. Then Drouot, returning home from the Quatre Dauphins for lunch, remarked in passing that early this morning the second consul had left for Grenoble, together with twelve mules and his daughter. Grenouille forced back the tears and ran off, straight to the Porte du Cour. He stopped to sniff in the square before the gate, and in the pure west wind, unsullied by the odours of the town, he did indeed find his golden thread again, thin and fragile, but absolutely unmistakable. The precious scent, however, was not blowing from the northwest, where the road leads towards Grenoble, but more from the direction of Cabri, if not directly out of the southwest. Grenouille asked the watch which road the second consul had taken. The guard pointed north. Not the road to Cabri, or the other one that went south toward Oribo and La Napoule? Definitely not, said the guard. He had watched with his own eyes. Grenouille ran back through town to his cabin, packed linen, pomade pot, spatula, scissors, and a small, smooth club of olive wood into his knapsack, and promptly took to the road. Not the road to Grenoble, but the one to which his nose directed him, to the south. This road, the direct road to La Napoule, led along the foothills of the Tanneron, through the river valleys of the Froyère and Siagne. 
It was an easy walk. Grenouille made rapid progress. As Auribeau emerged on his right, clinging to the mountains above him, he could smell that he had almost caught up with the runaways. A little later, and he had drawn even with them. He could now smell each one, could smell the aroma of their horses. At most, they were no more than a half mile west of him, somewhere in the forests of the Tanneron. They were holding course southwards towards the sea, just as he was. Around five o'clock that evening, Grenouille reached La Napoule. He went to the inn, ate, and asked for cheap lodging. He was a journeyman tanner from Nice, he said, on his way to Marseille. He could spend the night in a stall, they told him. There he lay down in a corner and rested. He could smell the three riders approaching. He need only wait. Two hours later, it was deep dusk by then, they arrived. To preserve their disguise, they had changed costumes. The two women now wore dark cloaks and veils, Rishi a black frock coat. He identified himself as a nobleman on his way from Castellan. In the morning, he wanted to be ferried over to the Ile de Lerin. The innkeeper should make arrangements for a boat to be ready by sunrise. Were there any other guests in the house besides himself and his people? No, said the innkeeper, only a journeyman tanner from Nice who was spending the night in a stall. Rishi sent the women to their room. He was going out to the stalls, he said, to get something from the saddlebags. At first he could not find the journeyman tanner. He had to ask a groom to give him a lantern. Then he saw him, lying on some straw and an old blanket in one corner, his head resting on his knapsack, sound asleep. He looked so totally insignificant that for a moment Rishi had the impression that he was not even there, but was merely a chimera cast by the swaying shadow of the lantern candle. At any rate, Rishi was immediately convinced that there was no danger whatever to fear from this almost touchingly harmless creature, and he left very quietly so as not to disturb his sleep and went back into the inn. He took his evening meal in his own room along with his daughter. He had not explained the purpose and goal of their journey to her, and did not do it even now, although she asked him. Tomorrow he would let her in on the secret, he said, but she could be certain that everything that he was planning and doing was for her good and would work towards her future happiness. After their meal, they played a few games of l'ombre, which he lost because he was forever gazing at her face to delight in her beauty instead of looking at his cards. Around nine o'clock, he brought her to her room, directly across from his own, kissed her goodnight, and locked the door from the outside. Then he went to bed himself. He was suddenly very tired from the exertions of the day and of the night before, and equally very satisfied with himself and how things had gone. Without the least thought or care, without any of the gloomy suspicions that until yesterday had plagued him and kept him awake every time he had put out his light, he instantly fell asleep and slept without a dream, without a moan, without a twitch or a nervous toss in his body back and forth. For the first time in a good while, Rishi found deep, peaceful, refreshing sleep. Around the same time, Grenouille got up from his bed in the stall. He too was satisfied with how things were going and felt completely refreshed, although he had not slept a single second. When Rishi had come to the stall looking for him, he had only feigned sleep, augmenting the impression of obvious harmlessness he already exuded with his odour of inconspicuousness. Moreover, in contrast to the way in which Rishi had perceived him, he had observed Rishi with utmost accuracy, olfactory accuracy, and Rishi's relief at the sight of him had definitely not escaped him. And so, at their meeting, each had convinced himself of the other's harmlessness, both correctly and falsely, and that was how it should be, Grenouille thought, for his apparent and Rishi's true harmlessness made it much easier for him, Grenouille, to go about his work, an opinion that, to be sure, Rishi would definitely have shared had the situation been reversed. Grenouille set to work with professional circumspection. He opened his knapsack, took out the linen, pomade and spatula, spread the cloth over the blanket on which he had lain, and began to brush on the fatty paste. This job took time, for it was important that the oil be applied in thinner or thicker layers, depending on what part of the body would end up lying on a particular patch of the cloth. The mouth and armpits, breasts, genitals and feet gave off greater amounts of scent than, for instance, shins, back and elbows. The palms more than the backs of the hands. 
eyebrows more than eyelids, etc., and therefore needed to be provided with a heavier dose of oil. Grenouille was creating a model, as it were, transferring onto the linen a scent diagram of the body to be treated, and this part of the job was actually the one that satisfied him most, for it was a matter of an artistic technique that incorporated equally one's knowledge, imagination, and manual dexterity, while at the same time it anticipated on an ideal plane the enjoyment awaiting one from the final results. Once he had applied the whole potful of pomade, he dabbed about here and there, removing a bit of oil from the cloth here, adding another there, retouching, checking the greasy landscape he had modelled one last time. With his nose, by the way, not with his eyes, for the whole business was carried on in total darkness, which was perhaps yet another reason for Grenouille's equably cheerful mood. There was nothing to distract him on this night of new moon. The world was nothing but odour and the soft sound of surf from the sea. He was in his element. Then he folded the cloth together like a tapestry, so that the oiled surfaces lay against one another. This was a painful procedure for him, because he knew well that despite the utmost caution, certain parts of the sculpted contours would be flattened or shifted. But there was no other way to transport the cloth. After he had folded it up small enough to be carried under his arm without too much difficulty, he tucked spatula, scissors, and the little olive wood club in his pockets, and crept out into the night. The sky was clouded over. There were no lights burning in the inn. The only glimmer on this pitch-dark night was the winking of the lighthouse at the fort on the Ile Sainte Marguerite, over a mile away to the east, a tiny bright needle-point in a raven-black cloth. A light, fishy wind was blowing from the bay. The dogs were asleep. Side 11 Grenouille walked to the back dormer of the threshing shed where a ladder stood propped. He picked the ladder up and, balancing it vertically, three rungs clamped under his free right arm, the rest of it pressed against his right shoulder, he moved across the courtyard until he was under her window. The window stood ajar. As he climbed the ladder, as easily as a set of stairs, he congratulated himself on the circumstances that made it possible for him to harvest this girl's scent here in La Napoule. In Grasse, where the house had barred windows and was tightly guarded, all this would have been much more difficult. She was even sleeping by herself here. He would not have to bother with eliminating the maid. He pushed up the casement, slipped into the room, and laid down his cloth. Then he turned to the bed. The dominant scent came from her hair, for she was lying on her stomach with her head pressed into the pillow and framed by the crook of her arm, presenting the back of her head in an almost ideal position for the blow by the club. The sound of the blow was a dull, grinding thud. He hated it. He hated it solely because it was a sound, a sound in the midst of his otherwise soundless procedure. He could bear that gruesome sound only by clenching his teeth, and after it was all over, standing off to one side stiff and implacable, as if he feared the sound would return from somewhere as a resounding echo. But it did not return. Instead, stillness returned to the room, an increased stillness, in fact, for now even the shuffle of the girl's breathing had ceased. And at once Grenouille's tenseness dissolved. One might have interpreted it more as a posture of reverence or some sort of crabbed moment of silence, and his body fell back to a pliable ease. He tucked the club away, and from here on all was bustle and business. First he unfolded the impregnating cloth, spread it loosely on its back over the table and chairs, taking care that the greased side not be touched. Then he pulled back the bedclothes. The glorious scent of the girl, welling up so suddenly warm and massive, did not stir him. He knew that scent, of course, and would savour it, savour it to intoxication later on, once he truly possessed it. But now the main thing was to capture as much of it as possible, let as little of it as possible evaporate, for now the watchwords were concentration and haste. With a few quick snips of his scissors, he cut open her nightgown, pulled it off, grabbed the oiled linen and tossed it over her naked body. Then he lifted her up, tugged the overhanging cloth under her, rolled her up in it as a baker rolls strudel, tucking in the corners, enveloping her from toes up to brow. Only her hair still stuck out from the mummy cloths. He cut it off close to her scalp and packed it inside her nightgown, which he then tied up into a bundle. 
Finally, he took a piece of cloth, still dangling free, and flapped it over the shaved skull, smoothed down the overlapping ends, gently pressed it tight with a finger. He examined the whole package. Not a slit, not a hole, not one bulging pleat was left through which the girl's scent could have escaped. She was perfectly packed. There was nothing to do but wait for six hours until the grey of dawn. He took the little armchair on which her clothes lay, dragged it to the bed and sat down. The gentle breath of her scent still clung to the ample black cloak, blending with the odour of aniseed biscuits she had put in her pocket as a snack for the journey. He put his feet up on the end of the bed, near her feet, covered himself with her dress and ate aniseed biscuits. He was tired, but he did not want to fall asleep because it was improper to sleep on the job, even if your job was merely to wait. He recalled the nights he had spent distilling in Baldini's workshop, the soot-blackened alembic, the flickering fire, the soft spitting sound the distillate made as it dripped from the cooling tube into the Florentine flask. From time to time you had to tend the fire, pour in more distilling water, change Florentine flasks, replace the exhausted stuff you were distilling. And yet it had always seemed to him that you stayed awake not so that you could take care of these occasional tasks, but because being awake had its own unique purpose. Even here in this bedchamber, where the process of enfleurage was proceeding all on its own, where in fact premature checking, turning or poking the fragrant package could only cause trouble, even here it seemed to Grenouille his waking presence was important. Sleep would have endangered the spirit of success. It was not especially difficult for him to stay awake and wait, despite his weariness. He loved this waiting. He had also loved it with the twenty-four other girls, for it was not a dull waiting till it's over, not even a yearning, expectant waiting, but an attendant, purposeful, in a certain sense, active waiting. Something was happening while you waited. The most essential thing was happening, and even if he himself was doing nothing, it was happening through him nevertheless. He had done his best. He had employed all his artistic skill. He had not made one single mistake. His performance had been unique. It would be crowned with success. He need only wait a few more hours. It filled him with profound satisfaction, this waiting. He had never felt so fine in all his life, so peaceful, so steady, so whole and at one with himself, not even back inside his mountain, as during these hours, when a craftsman took his rest sitting in the dark of night beside his victim, waiting and watching. They were the only moments when something like cheerful thoughts formed inside his gloomy brain. Strangely enough, these thoughts did not look towards the future. He did not think of the scent that he would glean in a few hours, nor of the perfume made of the auras of twenty-five maidens, nor of future plans, happiness and success. No, he thought of his past. He remembered the stations of his life, from Madame Gaillard's house and the moist, warm woodpile in front of it, to his journey today to the little village of La Napoule, which smelled like fish. He thought of Grimal the Tanner, of Giuseppe Baldini, of the Marquis de la Taillade d'Espinas. He thought of the city of Paris, of its great effluvium, that evil smell of a thousand iridescences. He thought of the red-headed girl in the Rue des Marais, of open country, of the spare wind, of forests. He thought, too, of the mountain in the Auvergne. He did not avoid such memories in the least, of his cave, of the air void of human beings. He thought of his dreams, and he thought of all these things with great satisfaction. Yes, it seemed to him, as he looked back over it, that he was a man to whom fortune had been especially kind, and that it had led him down some tortuous paths but that ultimately they had proved to be the right ones. How else would it have been possible for him to find his way here, into this dark chamber, at the goal of his desires? He was, now that he really considered it, a truly blessed individual. Feelings of humility and gratitude welled up within him. I thank you, he said softly. I thank you, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille for being what you are. So touched was he by himself. Then his eyelids closed, not for sleep, 
but so that he could surrender himself completely to the peace of this holy night. The peace filled his heart, but it seemed also as if it rained all about him. He smelled the peaceful sleep of the maid in the adjoining room, the deep contentment of Antoine Richie's sleep on the other side of the corridor. He smelled the peaceful slumber of the innkeeper and his servants, of the dogs, of the animals in their stalls, of the whole village, and of the sea. The wind had died away. Everything was still. Nothing disturbed the peace. Once he turned his foot to one side, and ever so softly touched Laure's foot. Not actually her foot, but simply the cloth that enveloped it, and beneath that the thin layer of oil drinking up her scent, her glorious scent, his scent. As the birds began to squawk, that is, a good while before the break of dawn, he got up and finished his task. He threw open the cloth and pulled it from the dead woman like a bandage. The fat peeled off nicely from her skin. Little scraps of it were left hanging only in the smallest crannies, and these he had to scrape off with his spatula. The remaining streaks of pomade he wiped off with her undershirt, using it to rub down her body from head to foot one last time, so thoroughly that even the oil in her own pores pearled from her skin, and with it the last flake and filament of her scent. Only now was she really dead for him, withered away, pale and limp as a fallen petal. He tossed the undershirt into the large scent-impregnated cloth, the only place where she had life now, placed her nightgown and her hair in it as well, and rolled it all up into a small, firm package that he clamped under his arm. He did not even take the trouble to cover the body on the bed, and although the black of night had already become the blue-grey of dawn, and objects in the room had begun to regain their contours, he did not cast a single glance at the bed to rest his eyes on her at least once in his life. Her form did not interest him. She no longer existed for him as a body, but only as a disembodied scent, and he was carrying that under his arm and taking it with him. Softly he swung out over the window sill and climbed down the ladder. The wind had come up again outside, and the sky was clearing, pouring a cold, dark blue light over the land. A half hour later, the scullery maid started the fire in the kitchen. As she came out of the house to fetch wood, she saw the ladder leaning there, but was still too sleepy to make any rhyme or reason of it. Shortly after six, the sun rose. Gigantic and golden red, it lifted up out of the sea between the Ile de Lera. Not a cloud was in the sky. A radiant spring day had begun. With his room facing west, Rishi did not awaken until seven. He had slept truly splendidly for the first time in months, and contrary to his custom, lay there yet another quarter of an hour, stretching and sighing with enjoyment as he listened to the pleasant hubbub rising up from the kitchen below. When he finally did get up and open the window wide, taking in the beautiful weather outside and breathing in the fresh morning air and listening to the sound of the surf, his good mood knew no bounds, and he puckered his lips and whistled a bright melody. While he dressed, he went on whistling, and was whistling still as he left his room and on winged feet approached the door to his daughter's room across the hall. He rapped, and rapped again very softly so as not to frighten her. There was no answer. He smiled. He could well understand that she was still sleeping. Carefully he inserted the key in the lock and turned the bolt, softly, very softly, considerately, not wanting to wake her, eager almost to find her still sleeping, wanting to kiss her awake once again, one last time, before he must give her to another man. The door sprang open, he entered, and the sunlight fell full into his eyes. Everything in the room sparkled, as if it were filled with glittering silver, and for a moment he had to shut his eyes against the pain of it. When he opened them again, he saw Laure lying on her bed, naked and dead and shorn clean and sparkling white, it was like his nightmare, the one he had dreamt in grass the night before last and had forgotten again. Every detail came back to him now as if in a blazing flash. In that instant everything was exactly as it had been in the dream, only very much brighter. The news of Lord Rishi's murder spread through the region of grass as fast as if the message had been, the king is dead, or war has been declared, or pirates have landed on the coast. 
and the awful sense of terror it triggered was similar as well. All at once the fear that they had so carefully forgotten was back again, as virulent as it had been last autumn, and with all the accompanying phenomena, panic, outrage, anger, hysterical suspicions, desperation. People stayed in their houses at night, locked up their daughters, barricaded themselves in, mistrusted one another and slept no more. Everyone assumed it would continue this time as it had before, a murder a week. The calendar seemed to have been set back six months. The dread was more paralyzing, however, than six months earlier, for people felt helpless at the sudden return of a danger that they had thought well behind them. If even the bishop's anathema had proved useless, if even Antoine Richy, the great Richy, the richest man in town, the second consul, a powerful, prudent man who had every kind of assistance available, if even he could not protect his child, if the murderer's hand was not to be deterred even by the hallowed beauty of Laure, for indeed she seemed a saint to everyone who had known her, especially now, afterwards, now that she was dead, what hope was there of escaping this murderer? He was more cruel than the plague, for you could flee from the plague, but not before this murderer, as the case of Rishi had proved. Apparently he possessed supernatural powers. He was most certainly in league with the devil, if he was not the devil himself. And so many people, especially the simpler souls, knew no better course than to go to church and pray, every tradesman to his patron, the locksmiths to St. Aloysius, the weavers to St. Crispin, the gardeners to St. Anthony, the perfumers to St. Joseph and they took their wives and daughters with them, praying together, eating and sleeping in the church. They did not leave during the day themselves now, convinced that the only possible refuge from the monster, if any refuge was to be had, was under the protection of the despairing parish and the gaze of the Madonna. Seeing that the church had failed once already, other quicker wits banded together in occult groups. Hiring, at great expense, a certified witch from Gourdon, they crept into one of the many limestone grottos of subterranean grass and celebrated black masses to curry the old gentleman's favour. Still others, in particular members of the upper middle class and the educated nobility, put their money on the most modern scientific methods, magnetising their houses, hypnotising their daughters, gathering in their salons for secret fluidal meetings and employing telepathy to drive off the murderer's spirit with communal thought emissions. The guilds organised a penitential procession from Grasse to Lanampoul and back. The monks from the town's five monasteries established services of perpetual prayer and ceaseless chants, so that soon unbroken lamentation was heard day and night, now on one street corner, now on another. Hardly anyone worked. Thus, with feverish passivity and something very like impatience, the people of Grasse awaited the murderer's next blow. No one doubted that it would fall and secretly everyone yearned to hear the horrible news, if only in the hope that it would not be about him but someone else. This time, however, the civil, regional and provincial authorities did not allow themselves to be infected by the hysterical mood of the citizenry. For the first time since the murderer of maidens had appeared on the scene, well-planned and effective cooperative efforts were instituted among the prefectures of Grasse, Draguignan and Toulon, among magistrates, police, commissaries, parliament and the navy. This cooperation among the powerful arose partly from fear of a general civil uprising, partly from the fact that only since Laure Richie's murder did they have clues that made systematic pursuit of the murderer possible for the first time. The murderer had been seen. Obviously they were dealing with the ominous journeyman Tanner who had spent the night of the murder in the inn stables and disappeared the next morning without a trace. According to the joint testimony of the innkeeper, the groom and Rishi, he was a nondescript, shortish fellow with a brownish coat and a coarse linen knapsack. Although in other respects the recollections of the three witnesses remained unusually vague, they had been unable to describe the man's face, hair colour or manner of speech, the innkeeper did add that, if he was not mistaken, he had noticed something awkward or limping about the stranger's posture and gait, as if he had a wounded leg or a crippled foot. Armed with these clues, two mounted troops had taken up pursuit of the murderer by noon of the same day, following the Marais Chaussée in the direction of Marseille, one along the coast, the other taking the inland road. The environs of La Napoule were combed by volunteers. Two commissioners from the provincial court at Grasse travelled to Nice to make inquiries about journeyman tanners. 
all ships departing from the ports of Frejus, Cannes and Antibes were checked. The roads leading across the border into Savoy were blocked and travellers required to identify themselves. For those who could read, an arrest warrant and description of the culprit appeared on all the town gates of Grasse, Vence and Gourdon and on village church doors. Town criers made three announcements daily. The report of a suspected club foot, of course, merely confirmed the view that the culprit was none other than the devil himself and tended more to arouse panic among the populace than to bring in useful information. But only after the presiding judge of the court in Grasse had, on Rishi's behalf, offered a reward of no less than 200 livres for information leading to the apprehension of the murderer did denunciations bring about the arrest of several journeyman tanners in Grasse, Opio and Gourdon one of whom, indeed, had the rotten luck of limping. They were already considering subjecting the man to torture, despite a solid alibi supported by several witnesses, when, ten days after the murder, a man from the city watch appeared at the magistrate's office and gave the following deposition. At noon on the day in question, he, Gabriel Taliasco, captain of the guard, while engaged in his customary duties at the Porte du Cour, had been approached by an individual who, as he now realised, fitted the description in the warrant almost exactly, and had been questioned repeatedly and insistently concerning the road by which the second consul and his caravan had departed the city that same morning. He had ascribed no importance to the incident, neither then nor later, and would most certainly have been unable to recall the individual purely on the basis of his own memory, so thoroughly unremarkable was the man, had he not seen him by chance only yesterday, right here in Grasse, in the Rue de la Louve, in front of the studio of Maître Drouot and Madame Arnulfi, on which occasion he had noticed that as the man walked back into the workshop, he had a definite limp. Grenouille was arrested an hour later. The innkeeper and his groom from La Napoule, who were in Grasse to identify the other suspects, immediately recognised him as the journeyman Tanner who had spent the night with them. It was he and no other. This must be the wanted murderer. They searched the workshop. They searched the cabin in the olive grove behind the Franciscan cloister. In one corner, hardly hidden, lay the shredded nightgown, the undershirt, and the red hair of Laure Rishi. And when they dug up the floor, piece by piece, the clothes and hair of the other twenty-four girls came to light. The wooden club used to kill the victims was found, and the linen knapsack. The evidence was overwhelming. The order was given to toll the church bells. The presiding judge announced by proclamation and public notice that the infamous murderer of young girls, sought now for almost one year, had finally been captured and was in custody. At first, people did not believe the report. They assumed it was a ruse by which the officials were covering up their own incompetence and attempting to calm the dangerously explosive mood of the populace. People remembered only too well when the word had been that the murderer had departed for Grenoble. This time fear had set its jaws too firmly into their souls. Not until the next day, when the evidence was displayed on the church square in front of the provost court, and it was a ghastly sight to behold, twenty-five garments with twenty-five crops of hair, all mounted like scarecrows on poles set up across the top of the square opposite the cathedral, did public opinion change. Hundreds of people filed by the macabre gallery. The victim's relatives would recognise the clothes and collapse, screaming. The rest of the crowd, partly because they were sensation seekers, partly because they wanted to be totally convinced, and demanded to see the murderer. The call soon became so loud, the unrest of the churning crowd in the small square so menacing, that the presiding judge decided to have Grenouille brought up out of his cell and to exhibit him at the window on the second floor of the provost court. As Grenouille appeared at the window, the roar turned to silence. All at once it was as totally quiet as if this were noon on a hot summer day, when everyone is out in the fields or has crept into the shade of his own home. Not a footfall, not a cough, not a breath was to be heard. The crowd was all eyes and one mouth agape for minutes on end. Not a soul could comprehend how this short, paltry, stoop-shouldered man there at the window, this mediocrity, this miserable non-entity, this cipher, could have committed over two dozen murders. He simply did not look like a murderer. No one could have said just how he had imagined the murderer, the devil himself, ought to look, but they were all agreed. 
not like this. And nevertheless, although the murderer did not in the least match their conception, and the exhibition, one would presume, could not have been less convincing, simply because of the physical reality of this man at the window, because he and no other was presented to them as the murderer, the effect was paradoxically persuasive. They all thought, it simply can't be true, and at the very same moment knew that it had to be true. To be sure, only after the guards had led the mannequin back into the shadows of the room, only after he was no longer present and visible, but existed, if for the briefest time, merely as a memory, one might almost say as a concept, the concept of an abominable murderer within people's brains, only then did the crowd's bewilderment subside and make way for an appropriate reaction. The mouths closed tight, the thousand eyes came alive again, and then there rang out, as if in one voice, a thundering cry of rage and revenge. We want him! And they set about to storm the provost court, to strangle him with their own hands, to tear him apart and scatter the pieces. It was all the guards could do to barricade the gate and force the mob back. Grenouille was promptly returned to his dungeon. The presiding judge appeared at the window and promised a trial remarkable for its swift and implacable justice. It took several hours, however, for the crowd to disperse, and several days for the town to quiet down to any extent. The proceedings against Grenouille did indeed move at an extraordinarily rapid pace, not only because the evidence was overwhelming, but also because the accused himself freely confessed to all the murders charged against him. But when asked about his motives, he had no convincing answer to give them. His repeated reply was that he had needed the girls, and that was why he had slain them. What had he needed them for, or what that was supposed to mean, that he needed them? To that he was silent. They then subjected him to torture, hanged him by his feet for hours, pumped him full of seven pints of water, put clamps on his feet, without the least success. The man seemed immune to physical pain, did not utter a sound, and when questioned again, replied with nothing more than, I needed them. The judges considered him insane. They discontinued the torture, and decided to bring the case to an end without further interrogation. The only delay that occurred after that was a legal squabble with the magistrate of Draguignan, in whose jurisdiction La Napoule was located, and with the parliament in Aix, both of whom wanted to take over the trial themselves. But the judges of Grasse would not let the matter be wrested from them now. They were the ones who had arrested the culprit. The overwhelming majority of the murders had been committed in the area under their jurisdiction, and if they handed the murderer over to another court, there was the threat of the pent-up anger of the citizenry. His blood would have to flow in Grasse. On the 15th of April, 1766, a verdict was rendered and read to the accused in his cell. The journeyman perfumer Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, it stated, shall within the next 48 hours be led out to the parade ground before the city gates and there be bound to a wooden cross, his face towards heaven, and while still alive be dealt 12 blows with an iron rod, breaking the joints of his arms, legs, hips and shoulders, and then, still bound to the cross, be raised up to hang until death. The customary act of mercy by which the offender was strangled with a cord once his body had been crushed, was expressly forbidden the executioner, even if the agonies of death should take days. The body was to be buried by night in an unmarked grave in the knacker's yard. Grenouille received the verdict without emotion. The bailiff asked him if he had a last wish. No, nothing, Grenouille said. He had everything he needed. A priest entered the cell to hear his confession, but came out again after fifteen minutes with nothing accomplished. When he had mentioned the name of God, the condemned man had looked at him with total incomprehension, as if he had heard the name for the first time, had then stretched out on his plank bed, and sunk at once into a deep sleep. To have said another word would have been pointless. During the next two days, many people came to see the famous murderer at close range, the guards let them peek through the shutter in the door and demanded six sol per peek. An etcher, who wanted to prepare a sketch, had to pay two francs. His subject, however, was rather a disappointment. The prisoner, bound at his wrists and ankles, lay on his plank bed the whole time and slept. His face was turned to the wall, and he responded to neither knocks nor shouts. 
Visitors were strictly banned from the cell, and despite some tempting offers, the guards did not dare disregard this prohibition. It was feared the prisoner might be murdered ahead of time by a relative of one of his victims. For the same reason, no one was allowed to offer him food. It might have been poisoned. During the whole period of imprisonment, Grenouille's food came from the servant's kitchen in the bishop's palace and had first to be tasted by the prison warden. The last two days, however, he ate nothing at all. He lay on his bed and slept. Occasionally his chains rattled, and if the guard hurried over to the shutter, he could watch Grenouille take a drink from his canteen, then throw himself back on his plank bed and go back to sleep. It seemed as if the man was so tired of life that he did not want to experience his last hours awake. Meanwhile, the parade grounds were readied for the execution. Carpenters built a scaffold, nine feet by nine feet square, and six feet high, with a railing and a sturdy set of stairs. Grass had never had one as fine as this, plus a wooden grandstand for local notables and a fence to separate them from the common people who were to be kept at some distance. In the buildings to the left and right of the Porte du Cour, and in the guardhouse itself, places at the windows had long since been rented out at exorbitant rates. The executioner's assistants had even leased the rooms of the patients in the Charité, which was located off to one side, and resold them to curious spectators at a handsome profit. The lemonade vendors stocked up with pitcherfuls of licorice water, the etcher printed up several hundred copies of the sketch he had made of the murderer in prison, touched up a bit from his own imagination, itinerant peddlers streamed into town by the dozens, the bakers baked souvenir biscuits. The executioner, Monsieur Papon, who had not had an offender to smash for years now, had a heavy squared iron rod forged for him and went off to the slaughterhouse to practice blows on carcasses. He was permitted only twelve hits and he had to strike true, crushing all twelve joints without damaging the vital body parts like the chest or head, a difficult business that demanded a fine touch and good timing. The citizens readied themselves for the event as if for a high holiday. That there would be no work that day went without saying. The women ironed their holiday dresses, the men dusted off their frock coats and had their boots polished to a high gloss. Whoever held military rank or occupied public office, whoever was a guild master, an attorney at law, a notary, a head of a fraternal order, or held any other position of importance, donned his uniform or official garb, along with his medals, sashes, chains and periwig powdered to a chalky white. Pious folk intended to assemble immediately afterwards for religious services. The disciples of Satan planned a hearty Luciferian mass of thanksgiving. The educated aristocracy were going to gather for magnetic seances at the manors of the Cabri, Villeneuve and Font Michel. The roasting and baking had begun in the kitchens, the wine had been fetched from the cellars, the floral displays from the market, and the organist and choir were practising in the cathedral. In the Richy household on the Rue Droite, everything remained quiet. Richy had forbidden any preparations for the Day of Liberation, as people were calling the murderer's execution day. It all disgusted him. The sudden eruption of renewed fear among the populace had disgusted him. Their feverish joy of anticipation disgusted him. The people themselves, every one of them, disgusted him. He had not participated in the presentation of the culprit and his victims in the cathedral square, nor in the trial, nor in the obscene procession of sensation-seekers filing past the cell of the condemned man. He had requested that the court come to his home for him to identify his daughter's hair and clothing, had given his testimony briefly and calmly, and had asked that they leave him those items as keepsakes, which they did. He carried them to Law's room, laid the shredded nightgown and undershirt on her bed, spread the red hair over the pillow, sat down beside them, and did not leave the room again day or night, as if, by pointlessly standing guard now, he could make good what he had neglected to do that night in La Napoule. He was so full of disgust, disgust at the world and at himself, that he could not weep. He was also disgusted by the murderer, he did not want to regard him as a human being, but only as a victim to be slaughtered. He did not want to see him until the execution, when he would be laid on the cross and the twelve blows crashed down upon him. Then he would want to see him, want to see him from up close, and he had had a place reserved for himself in the front row. And when the crowd had wandered off after a few hours, he wanted to climb up onto the bloody scaffold and crouch next to him, 
keeping watch by night, by day, for however long he had to, and look into the eyes of this man, the murderer of his daughter, and drop by drop to trickle the disgust within him into those eyes, to pour out his disgust like burning acid over the man in his death agonies, until the beast perished. And after that? What would he do after that? He did not know. Perhaps resume his normal life. Perhaps get married. Perhaps father a son. Perhaps do nothing at all. Perhaps die. It made no difference whatever to him. To think about it seemed to him as pointless as to think about what he could do after his own death. Nothing, of course. Nothing that he could know at this point. The execution was scheduled for five in the afternoon. The first spectators had arrived by morning and secured themselves places. They brought chairs and footstools with them, pillows, food, wine and their children. Around noon, masses of country people streamed in from all directions and the parade grounds were soon so packed that new arrivals had to camp along the road to Grenoble and on the terrace-like gardens and fields that rose at the far end of the area. Vendors were already doing a brisk business. People ate, people drank, everything hummed and simmered as at a country fair. Soon there were a good 10,000 people gathered, more than for the crowning of the Queen of the Jasmine, more than for the largest guild procession, more than Grass had ever seen before. They stood far up to the slopes, they hung in the trees, they squatted atop walls and on the roofs, they pressed together ten or twelve to a window. Only in the centre of the grounds, protected by the fence barricade, as if stamped and cut from the dough of the crowd, was there still an open space for the grandstand and the scaffold, which suddenly appeared very small, like a toy or a stage of a pipe theatre. And one pathway was left open, leading from the place of execution to the Porte du Cour and into the Rue Droite. Shortly after three, Monsieur Papon and his henchmen appeared. The applause swept forward like thunder. They carried two wooden beams, forming a St. Andrew's cross to the scaffold, and set it at a good working height by propping it up on four carpenter's horses. A journeyman carpenter nailed it down. Every move, every gesture of the deputy executioners and the carpenter was greeted by the crowd's applause. And when Papon stepped forward with his iron rod, walked around the cross, measuring his steps, striking an imaginary blow, now on one side, now on the other, there was an eruption of downright jubilation. At four, the grandstand began to fill. There were many fine folk to admire, rich gentlemen with lackeys and fine manners, beautiful women, big hats, shimmering clothes. The whole of the nobility from both town and country was on hand. The gentlemen of the council appeared in closed rank, the two consuls at their head. Rishi was dressed in black, with black stockings and a black hat. Behind the council, the magistrates marched in, led by the presiding judge of the court. Last of all, in an open sedan chair, came the bishop, wearing gleaming purple vestments and a little green hat. Whoever still had his cap on doffed it now, to be sure. This was awe-inspiring. Then nothing happened for about ten minutes. The lords and ladies had taken their places. The common folk waited impassively. No one was eating now. They all waited. Papon and his henchmen stood on the scaffold platform as if they too had been nailed down. The sun hung large and yellow over the Esterel. From the valley of grass a warm wind came up, bearing with it the scent of orange blossoms. It was very warm and almost implausibly still. Finally, when it seemed the tension could last no longer without its bursting into a thousand-voiced scream, into a tumult, a frenzy, or into some other mob scene, above the stillness they heard the clatter of horses and the creaking of wheels. Down the Rue Droite came a carriage drawn by a pair of horses, the police lieutenant's carriage. It drove through the city gate and reappeared for all to see in the narrow path leading to the scaffold. The police lieutenant had insisted on this manner of arrival, since otherwise he could not guarantee the safety of the convicted man. It was certainly not the customary practice. The prison was hardly five minutes away from the place of execution, and if a condemned man, for whatever reason, could not have managed the short distance on foot, then he would have travelled it in an open donkey cart. 
that a man should be driven to his own execution in a coach with a driver, liveried footmen and a mounted guard. No one had ever seen anything like that. And nevertheless, there was no sign of unrest or displeasure among the crowd. On the contrary, people were satisfied that at least something was happening, considered the idea of the coach a clever stroke, just as at the theatre people enjoy a familiar play when it is presented in some surprisingly new fashion. Many even thought the grand entrance appropriate. Such an extraordinarily abominable criminal deserved extraordinary treatment. You couldn't drag him to the scaffold in chains like a common thief and kill him. There would have been nothing sensational about that. But to lead him from his upholstered equipage to the St Andrew's Cross, that was an incomparably imaginative bit of cruelty. The carriage stopped midway between the scaffold and the grandstand. The footmen jumped down, opened the carriage door and folded down the steps. The police lieutenant climbed out, behind him an officer of the guard, and finally Grenouille. He was wearing a blue frock coat, a white shirt, white silk stockings and buckled black shoes. He was not bound. No one let him by the arm. He got out of the carriage as if he were a free man. Side 12 and then a miracle occurred, or something very like a miracle, or at least something so incomprehensible, so unprecedented and so unbelievable that everyone who witnessed it would have called it a miracle afterwards if they had taken the notion to speak of it at all, which was not the case, since afterwards every single one of them was ashamed to have had any part in it whatever. What happened was that from one moment to the next the 10,000 people on the parade grounds and on the slopes surrounding it felt themselves infused with the unshakable belief that the man in the blue frock coat who had just climbed out of the carriage could not possibly be a murderer. Not that they doubted his identity. The man standing there was the same one whom they had seen just a few days before at the window of the provost court on the church square and whom, had they been able to get their hands on him, they would have lynched with savage hatred the same one who only two days before had been lawfully condemned on the basis of overwhelming evidence and his own confession. The same one whose slaughter at the hands of the executioner they had eagerly awaited only a few minutes before. It was he, no doubt of it. And yet, it was not he either. It could not be he. He could not be a murderer. The man who stood at the scaffold was innocence personified. All of them, from the bishop to the lemonade vendor, from the marquis to the little washerwoman, from the presiding judge to the street urchin, knew it in a flash. Papon knew it too, and his great hands, still clutching the iron rod, trembled. All at once his strong arms were as weak, his knees as wobbly, his heart as anxious as a child's. He would not be able to lift that rod, would never in his life have the strength to lift it against this little innocent man. Oh, he dreaded the moment when they would lead him forward. He tottered, had to prop himself up with his death-dealing rod to keep from sinking feebly to his knees, the great, the mighty Papon. The ten thousand men and women, children and patriarchs assembled there felt no different. They grew weak as young maidens who have succumbed to the charms of a lover. They were overcome by a powerful sense of goodwill, of tenderness, of crazy, childish infatuation. Yes, God help them, of love for this little homicidal man. And they were unable, unwilling to do anything about it. It was like a fit of weeping you cannot fight down, like tears that have been held back too long and rise up from deep within you, dissolving whatever resists them, liquefying it and flushing it away. These people were now pure liquid, their spirits and minds were melted. Nothing was left but an amorphous fluid, and all they could feel was their hearts floating and sloshing about within them, and they laid those hearts, each man, each woman, in the hands of the little man in the blue frock coat, for better or worse. They loved him. Grenouille had been standing at the open carriage door for several minutes now, not moving at all. The footman next to him had sunk to his knees and sank further still until achieving the fully prostrate position customary in the Orient before a sultan or Allah. 
and even in this posture he still quivered and swayed, trying to sink even further, to lie flat upon the earth, to lie within it, under it. He wanted to sink to the opposite side of the world, out of pure subservience. The officer of the guard and the police lieutenant, doughty fellows both, whose duty it was now to lead the condemned man to the scaffold and hand him over to his executioner, could no longer manage anything like a coordinated action. They wept and removed their hats, put them back on, cast themselves to the ground, fell into each other's arms, withdrew again, flapped their arms absurdly in the air, wrung their hands, twitched and grimaced like victims of St. Vitus's dance. The noble personages, being somewhat further away, abandoned themselves to their emotions with hardly more discretion. Each gave free rein to the urges of his or her heart. There were women who, with one look at Grenouille, thrust their fists into their laps and sighed with bliss, and others who, in their burning desire for this splendid young man, for so he appeared to them, fainted dead away without further ado. There were gentlemen who kept springing up and sitting down and leaping up again, snorting vigorously and grasping the hilts of their swords as if to draw them, and then when they did, each thrusting his blade back in so that it rattled and clattered, and others who cast their eyes mutely to heaven and clenched their hands in prayer. And there was Monseigneur the bishop, who, as if he were taken ill, slumped forward and banged his forehead against his knees, sending his little green hat rolling, when in fact he was not ill at all but rather, for the first time in his life, basking in religious rapture, for a miracle had occurred before their very eyes. The Lord God had personally stayed the executioner's hand by disclosing as an angel the very man who had for all the world appeared a murderer. Oh, that such a thing had happened here in the eighteenth century! How great was the Lord! And how small and petty was he himself who had spoken his anathema without himself believing in it, merely to pacify the populace. Oh, what presumption! Oh, what a lack of faith! And now the Lord had performed a miracle. Oh, what splendid humiliation! What sweet abasement! What grace to be a bishop thus chastised by God! Meanwhile the masses on the other side of the barricade were giving themselves over ever more shamelessly to the uncanny rush of emotion that Grenouille's appearance had unleashed. Those who at the start had merely felt sympathy and compassion were now filled with naked, insatiable desire, and those who had at first admired and desired were now driven to ecstasy. They all regarded the man in the blue frock coat as the most handsome, attractive, and perfect creature they could imagine. To the nuns he appeared to be the saviour in person, to the Satanists as the shining lord of darkness, and to those who were citizens of the Enlightenment as the highest principle to young maidens as a fairy tale prince, to men as their ideal image of themselves. And they all felt as if he had seen through them at their most vulnerable point, grasped them, touched their erotic core. It was as if the man had ten thousand invisible hands and had laid a hand on the genitals of the ten thousand people surrounding him and fondled them in just the way that each of them, whether man or woman, desired in his or her most secret fantasies. The result was that the scheduled execution of one of the most abominable criminals of the age degenerated into the largest orgy the world had seen since the second century before Christ. Respectable women ripped open their blouses, bared their breasts, cried out hysterically, threw themselves on the ground with skirts hitched high. The men's gazes stumbled madly over this landscape of straddling flesh. With quivering fingers they tugged to pull from their trousers their members, frozen stiff by some invisible frost. They fell down anywhere with a groan and copulated in the most impossible positions and combinations. Grandfather with virgin, odd jobber with lawyer's spouse, apprentice with nun, Jesuit with Freemason's wife, all topsy-turvy, just as opportunity presented. The air was heavy with the sweet odour of sweating lust, and filled with loud cries, grunts, and moans from ten thousand human beasts. It was infernal. Grenouille stood there and smiled, or rather it seemed to the people who saw him that he was smiling, the most innocent, loving, enchanting, and at the same time most seductive smile in the world. But in fact it was not a smile, but an ugly, cynical smirk that lay upon his lips 
reflecting both his total triumph and his total contempt. He, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, born with no odour of his own on the most stinking spot in the world, amid garbage, dung and putrefaction, raised without love, with no warmth of a human soul, surviving solely on impudence and the power of loathing, small, hunchbacked, lame, ugly, shunned, an abomination within and without, he had managed to make the world admire him, to hell with admire, love him, desire him, idolise him. He had performed a Promethean feat. He had persevered until, with infinite cunning, he had obtained for himself that divine spark, something laid gratis in the cradle of every other human being, but withheld from him alone. And not merely that. He had himself actually struck that spark upon himself. He was even greater than Prometheus. He had created an aura more radiant and more effective than any human being had ever possessed before him. And he owed it to no one, not to a father nor a mother, and least of all to a gracious God, but to himself alone. He was in very truth his own God, and a more splendid God than the God that stank of incense and was quartered in churches. A flesh-and-blood bishop was on his knees before him, whimpering with pleasure. The rich and the mighty, proud ladies and gentlemen, were fawning in adoration, while the common folk all around, among them the fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters of his victims, celebrated an orgy in his honour and in his name. A nod of his head, and they would all renounce their god and worship him, Grenouille the Great. Yes, he was Grenouille the Great. Now it had become manifest. It was he, just as in his narcissistic fantasies of old, but now in reality. And in that moment he experienced the greatest triumph of his life, and he was terrified. He was terrified because he could not enjoy one second of it. In that moment, as he stepped out of the carriage into the bright sunlight of the parade grounds, clad in the perfume that made people love him, the perfume on which he had worked for two years, the perfume that he had thirsted to possess his whole life long. In that moment, as he saw and smelled how irresistible its effect was and how with lightning speed it spread and made captives of the people all around him, in that moment his whole disgust for humankind rose up again within him and completely soured his triumph, so that he felt not only no joy but not even the least bit of satisfaction. What he had always longed for, that other people should love him, became at the moment of its achievement unbearable, because he did not love them himself. He hated them. And suddenly he knew that he had never found gratification in love, but always only in hatred, in hating and in being hated. But the hate he felt for people remained without an echo, the more he hated them at this moment, the more they worshipped him, for they perceived only his counterfeit aura, his fragrant disguise, his stolen perfume, and it was indeed a scent to be worshipped. He would have loved right now to have exterminated these people from the earth, every stupid, stinking, eroticised one of them, just as he had once exterminated alien odours from the world of his raven-black soul. And he wanted them to realise how much he hated them, and for them, realising that it was the only emotion that he had ever truly felt to return that hate and exterminate him just as they had originally intended. For once in his life, he wanted to empty himself. For once in his life, he wanted to be like other people and empty himself of what was inside him. What they did with their love and their stupid adoration, he would do with his hate. For once, just for once, he wanted to be apprehended in his true being, for other human beings to respond with an answer to his only true emotion, hatred. But nothing came of that. Nothing could ever come of it, and most certainly not on this day. For after all, he was masked with the best perfume in the world, and beneath his mask there was no face, but only his total odorlessness. Suddenly he was sick to his stomach, for he felt the fog rising again just as it had back then in his cave, in his dream, in his sleep, in his heart, in his fantasy, all at once fog was rising, the dreadful fog from his own odour, 
which he could not smell, because he was odourless, and just as then he was filled with boundless fear and terror, felt as if he were going to suffocate. But this time it was different. This was no dream, no sleep, but naked reality, and different too because he was not lying alone in a cave, but standing in a public place before ten thousand people, and different because here no scream would help to wake and free him, no flight would rescue him and bring him into the good, warm world, for here and now this was the world, and this, here and now, was his dream come true. And he had wanted it thus. The horrible, suffocating fog rose up from the morass of his soul, while all around him people moaned in orgiastic and orgasmic rapture. A man came running up to him. He had leaped up out of the first row of the notable's grandstand so violently that his black hat toppled from his head, and now, with his black frock coat billowing, he fluttered across the parade grounds like a raven or an avenging angel. It was Rishi. He is going to kill me, thought Grenouille. He is the only one who has not let himself be deceived by my mask. He won't let himself be deceived. The scent of his daughter is clinging to me, betraying me as surely as blood. He has got to recognize me and kill me. He has got to do it and he spread his arms wide to receive the angel storming down upon him. He already could feel the thrust of the dagger or sword tickling so wonderfully at his breast, and the blade passing through his arm or of scent and the suffocating fog right to the middle of his cold heart. Finally, finally something in his heart, something other than himself, and he sensed his deliverance already at hand. And then... Suddenly there was Rishi at his breast, no avenging angel, but a shaken, pitiably sobbing Rishi, who threw his arms around him, clutching him very tight, as if he could find no other footing in a sea of bliss. No liberating thrust of the dagger, no prick to the heart, not even a curse or a cry of hatred. Instead, Rishi's cheek wet with tears glued to his, and quivering lips that whimpered to him, Forgive me, my son. My dear son, forgive me. With that, everything within him went white before his eyes, while the world outside went raven black. The trapped fog condensed to a raging liquid like frothy, boiling milk. It inundated him, pressed its unbearable weight against the inner shell of his body, could find no way out. He wanted to flee, for God's sake to flee, but where? He wanted to burst, to explode, to keep from suffocating on himself. Finally he sank down and lost consciousness. When he again came to, he was lying in Lor Rishi's bed. The reliquary of clothes and hair had been removed. A candle was burning on the night table. The window was ajar, and he could hear the exultation of the town's revels in the distance. Antoine Richy was sitting on a footstool beside the bed, watching him. He had placed Grenouille's hand in his own and was stroking it. Even before he opened his eyes, Grenouille had checked the atmosphere. Everything was quiet within him. There was no more boiling or bursting. His soul was again dominated as usual by cold night, just what he needed for a frosty and clear conscious mind to be directed to the outside world. There he smelled his perfume. It had changed. Its peaks had levelled off, so that the core of Lor's scent emerged more splendidly than ever, a mild, dark, glowing fire. He felt secure. He knew that he was unassailable for a few hours yet, and he opened his eyes. Rishi's gaze rested on him. An infinite benevolence lay in that gaze, tenderness, compassion, the empty, fatuous profundity of a lover. He smiled, pressed Grenouille's hand more tightly and said, It will all turn out all right. The magistrate has overturned his verdict. All the witnesses have recanted. You are free. You can do whatever you want. But I would like you to stay here with me. I have lost a daughter, but I want to gain you as my son. You're very much like her. You are beautiful like her. Your hair, your mouth your hand. I have been holding your hand all this time. Your hand is like hers. And when I look into your eyes, 
It's as if she were looking at me. You are her brother, and I want you to become my son, my friend, my pride and joy, my heir. Are your parents still alive? Grenouille shook his head, and Rishi's face turned beet red for joy. Then will you be my son? He stammered, jumping up from his stool to sit on the edge of the bed and clasp Grenouille's other hand as well. Will you? Will you? Will you have me for a father? Don't say anything. Don't speak. You are still too weak to talk. Just nod. Grenouille nodded. And joy erupted from Rishi's every pore like scarlet sweat, and he bent down to Grenouille and kissed him on the mouth. Sleep now, my dear son, he said, standing back up again. I will keep watch over you until you have fallen asleep. And after he observed him in mute bliss for a long time, you have made me very, very happy. Grenouille pulled the corners of his mouth apart, the way he had noticed people do when they smile. Then he closed his eyes. He waited a while before letting his respiration grow easy and deep, like a sleeper's. He could feel Rishi's loving gaze on his face. At one point he felt Rishi bending forward again to kiss him, but then refraining for fear of waking him. Finally the candle was blown out, and Rishi slipped on tiptoe from the room. Grenouille lay there until he could no longer hear a sound in the house or the town. When he got up it was already dawn. He was dressed and stole away, softly down the hall, softly down the stairs, and through the salon out onto the terrace. From there you could see over the city wall, out across the valley surrounding grass. A light fog, or better a haze, hung now over the fields, and the odours that came from them, grass, broom and rose, seemed washed clean, comfortingly plain and simple. Grenouille crossed the garden and climbed over the wall. When he came to the parade grounds he had to fight his way through human effluvia before he reached open country. The whole area and the slopes looked like a gigantic, debauched army camp. Drunken forms by the thousands lay all about, exhausted by the dissipations of their nocturnal festivities, many of them naked, many half exposed, half covered by their clothes, which they had used as a sort of blanket to creep under. It stank of sour wine, of brandy, of sweat and piss, of baby shit and charred meat. The campfires where they had roasted, drunk and danced were still smoking here and there. Now and then a murmur or a snigger would gurgle up from thousands of snores. It was possible that a few people were still awake, guzzling away the last scraps of consciousness from their brains. But no one saw Grenouille, who carefully but quickly climbed over the scattered bodies as if moving across a swamp. And those who saw him did not recognize him. He no longer had any scent. The miracle was over. Once he had crossed the grounds, he did not take the road towards Grenoble, nor the one to Cabri, but walked straight across the fields towards the west, never once turning to look back. When the sun rose, fat and yellow and scorching hot, he had long since vanished. The people of Grasse awoke with a terrible hangover. Even those who had not drunk had heads heavy as lead and were wretchedly sick to their stomachs and wretchedly sick at heart. Out on the parade grounds, by bright sunlight, simple peasants searched for the clothes they had flung off in the excesses of their orgy. Respectable women searched for their husbands and children. Total strangers unwound themselves in horror from intimate embraces. Acquaintances, neighbours, spouses were suddenly standing opposite each other, painfully embarrassed by their public nakedness. For many of them the experience was so ghastly, so completely inexplicable and incompatible with their genuine moral precepts, that they literally erased it from their memories the moment it happened, and as a result truly could not recall any of it later. Others, who were not in such sovereign control of their faculties of perception, tried to shut their eyes, their ears, their minds to it, which was not all that easy, for the shame of it was too obvious and too universal. As soon as someone found his effects and his kin, he beat as hasty and inconspicuous a retreat as possible. By noon the grounds were as good as swept clean. The townspeople did not emerge from their houses until evening, if at all, to pursue their most pressing errands. 
Their greetings when they met were of the most cursory sort. They made nothing but small talk. Not a word was said about the events of the morning and the previous night. They were as modest now as they had been uninhibited and brash yesterday. And they were all like that, for they were all guilty. Never was there greater harmony among the citizens of Grass than on that day. People lived packed in cotton. Of course, many of them, because of the offices they held, were forced to deal directly with what had happened. The continuity of public life, the inviolability of law and order, demanded that swift measures be taken. The town council was in session by afternoon. The gentlemen, the second consul among them, embraced one another mutely, as if by this conspiratorial gesture the body were newly constituted. Then, without so much as mentioning the events themselves, or even the name Grenouille, they unanimously resolved immediately to have the scaffold and grandstand on the parade grounds dismantled and to have the trampled fields surrounding them restored to their former orderly state. For this purpose, a hundred and sixty leaves were appropriated. At this same time, the judges met at the provost court. The magistrates agreed without debate to regard the case of G as settled, to close the files, to place them in the archives without registry, and to open new proceedings against the thus far unidentified murderer of twenty-five maidens in the region around Grass. The order was passed to the police lieutenant to begin his investigation immediately. By the next day, he had already made new discoveries. On the basis of incontrovertible evidence, he arrested Dominique Drouot, maître parfumeur, in the Rue de la Louve, since, after all, it was in his cabin that the clothes and hair of all the victims had been found. The judges were not deceived by the lies he told at first. After fourteen hours of torture, he confessed everything and even begged to be executed as soon as possible, which wish was granted and the execution set for the following day. They strung him up by the grey light of dawn without any fuss, without scaffold or grandstand, with only the hangman, a magistrate of the court, a doctor and a priest in attendance. Once death had occurred, had been verified and duly recorded, the body was promptly buried. With that, the case was closed. The town had forgotten it in any event, forgotten it so totally that travellers who passed through in the days that followed and casually inquired about Grass's infamous murderer of young maidens found not a single sane person who could give them any information. Only a few fools from the Charité, notorious lunatics, babbled something or other about a great feast on the Place du Cour, on account of which they had been forced to vacate their rooms. And soon life had returned completely to normal. People worked hard and slept well and went about their business and behaved decently. Water gushed, as it always had, from the fountains and wells, sending muck floating down the streets. Once again the town clung shabbily but proudly to its slopes above the fertile basin. The sun shone warmly. Soon it was May. They harvested roses. Grenouille travelled by night. As he had done at the beginning of his journeys, he steered clear of cities, avoided highways, lay down to sleep at daybreak, arose in the evening, and walked on. He fed on whatever he found on the way, grasses, mushrooms, flowers, dead birds, worms. He marched through Provence. South of Orange, he crossed the Rhone in a stolen boat, followed the Ardèche deep into the Cévennes, and then the Allier northwards. In the Auvergne, he drew close to the Plon du Cantal. He saw it lying to the west, huge and silver-grey in the moonlight, and he smelled the cool wind that came from it. But he felt no urge to visit it. He no longer yearned for his life in the cave. He had experienced that life once, and it had proved unlivable. Just as had his other experience, life among human beings, he was suffocated by both worlds. He no longer wanted to live at all. He wanted to go to Paris and die. That was what he wanted. From time to time he reached in his pocket and closed his hand around the little glass flacon of his perfume. The bottle was still almost full. He had used only a drop of it for his performance in grass. There was enough left to enslave the whole world. If he wanted, he could be fated in Paris, not by tens of thousands, but by hundreds of thousands of people, or could walk out to Versailles and have the king kiss his feet write the Pope a perfumed letter and reveal himself as the new Messiah, be anointed in Notre Dame as supreme emperor before kings and emperors, 
or even as God come to earth, if there was such a thing as God having himself anointed. He could do all that, if only he wanted to. He possessed the power. He held it in his hand, a power stronger than the power of money or the power of terror or the power of death the invincible power to command the love of mankind. There was only one thing that power could not do. It could not make him able to smell himself. And though his perfume might allow him to appear before the world as a god, if he could not smell himself and thus never know who he was, to hell with it, with the world, with himself, with his perfume, the hand that had grasped the flacon was fragrant with a faint scent, and when he put it to his nose and sniffed, he grew wistful and forgot to walk on and stood there smelling. No one knows how good this perfume really is, he thought. No one knows how well made it is. Other people are merely conquered by its effect, don't even know that it's a perfume that's working on them, enslaving them. The only one who has ever recognized it for its true beauty is me, because I created it myself. And at the same time, I'm the only one that it cannot enslave. I am the only person for whom it is meaningless. And on another occasion, he was already in Burgundy, when I was standing there at the wall below the garden where the red-headed girl was playing, and her scent came floating down to me, or better, the promise of her scent, for the scent she would carry later, did not even exist yet. Maybe what I felt that day is like what the people on the parade grounds felt when I flooded them with my perfume. But then he cast the thought aside. No, it was something else, because I knew that I desired the scent, not the girl. But those people believed that they desired me, and what they really desired remained a mystery to them. Then he thought no more, for thinking was not his strong point, and then, too, he was already in the Orléonais. He crossed the Loire at Sully. The next day he had the odour of Paris in his nose. On the 25th of June, 1766, at six in the morning, he entered the city via the Rue Saint-Jacques. It turned out to be a hot day, the hottest of the year thus far. The thousands of odours and stenches oozed out as if from thousands of festering boils. Not a breeze stirred. The vegetables in the market stalls shriveled up. Meat and fish rotted. Tainted air hung in the narrow streets. Even the river seemed to have stopped flowing, to have stagnated. It stank. It was a day like the one on which Grenouille was born. He walked across the Pont Neuf to the right bank, and then down to Léal and the Cimetière des Innocents. He sat down in the arcades of the charnel house bordering the Rue aux Fers. Before him lay the cemetery grounds like a cratered battlefield, burrowed and ditched and trenched with graves, sown with skulls and bones, not a tree, bush or blade of grass, a garbage dump of death. Not a soul was to be seen. The stench of corpses was so heavy that even the grave diggers had retreated. Only after the sun had gone down did they come out again to scoop out holes for the dead by torchlight until late into the night. But then, after midnight, the gravediggers had left by then, the place came alive with all sorts of riffraff, thieves, murderers, cutthroats, whores, deserters, young desperados. A small campfire was lit for cooking and in the hope of masking the stench. When Grenouille came out of the arcades and mixed in with these people, they at first took no notice of him. He was able to walk up to the fire unchallenged, as if he were one of them. That later helped to confirm the view that they must have been dealing with a ghost or an angel or some other supernatural being, because normally they were very touchy about the approach of any stranger. The little man in the blue frock coat, however, had suddenly simply been there, as if he had sprouted out of the ground, and he had had a little bottle in his hand that he unstoppered. That was the first thing that any of them could recall, that he had stood there and unstoppered a bottle. And then he had sprinkled himself all over with the contents of the bottle, and all at once he had been bathed in beauty, like blazing fire. For a moment they fell back in awe and pure amazement. 
but in the same instant they sensed their falling back was more like preparing for a running start, that their awe was turning to desire, their amazement to rapture. They felt themselves drawn to this angel of a man. A frenzied, alluring force came from him, a riptide no human could have resisted, all the less because no human would have wanted to resist it, for what that tide was pulling under and dragging away was the human will itself, straight to him. They had formed a circle around him, twenty, thirty people, and their circle grew smaller and smaller. Soon the circle could not contain them all. They began to push, to shove and to elbow, each of them trying to be closest to the centre. And then all at once the last inhibition collapsed within them, and the circle collapsed with it. They lunged at the angel, pounced on him, threw him to the ground. Each of them wanted to touch him, wanted to have a piece of him, a feather, a bit of plumage, a spark from that wonderful fire. They tore away his clothes, his hair, his skin from his body. They plucked him, they drove their claws and teeth into his flesh. They attacked him like hyenas. But the human body is tough and not easily dismembered. Even horses have great difficulty accomplishing it. And so the flash of knives soon followed, thrusting and slicing, and then the swish of axes and cleavers aimed at the joints, hacking and crushing the bones. In very short order the angel was divided into thirty pieces, and every animal in the pack snatched a piece for itself, and then, driven by voluptuous lust, dropped back to devour it. A half hour later Jean-Baptiste Grenouille had disappeared utterly from the earth. When the cannibals found their way back together after disposing of their meal, no one said a word. Someone would belch a bit, or spit out a fragment of bone, or softly smack with his tongue, or kick a leftover shred of blue frock coat into the flames. They were all a little embarrassed and afraid to look at one another. They had all, whether man or woman, committed a murder or some other despicable crime at one time or another. But to eat a human being? They would never, so they thought, have been capable of anything that horrible. And they were amazed that it had been so very easy for them, and that, embarrassed as they were, they did not feel the tiniest twinge of conscience. On the contrary, though the meal lay rather heavy on their stomachs, their hearts were definitely light. All of a sudden there were delightful, bright flutterings in their dark souls, and on their faces was a delicate, virginal glow of happiness. Perhaps that was why they were shy about looking up and gazing into one another's eyes. When they finally did dare it, at first with stolen glances and then candid ones, they had to smile. They were uncommonly proud. For the first time, they had done something out of love.